morning church. We hope you're having a good day so far. Amen. Now I'm going to read you a psalm in Psalm 62. It says, Truly my soul find rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. In my fortress I will never be shaken. Today as we worship together, would you just keep that in mind, that He is the one that brings you salvation. He's the one that gives you rest. So Lord, we just thank you and yes, we ask that you just come and have your way today. Yes, Jesus. Sometimes on this journey I get lost in my mistakes What looks to be like we Oh, 
Well, welcome to our Sunday service. My name is Pastor Dennis Boudreau, and I am excited once again to preach the Word. We have started last week a Christ is our all in all. We're taking an in-depth look at the book of Colossians. We're going to take it verse by verse. I kind of like doing that some once in a while. Hallelujah. The book of Colossians is a very, very deep book. It exposes and explains and it shows the beauty of Christ that he is our all and all. Today we're going to finish off the second half starting at verse 19 of chapter 1 of Colossians all the way to, to the end. I want to look at the effects of reconciliation and also our sacrificial service. We live a sacrifice unto God. I mean, if we take a look at everything that Jesus did for us, we cannot but live that way. Otherwise, it would be a mockery unto him. You know, one of the coolest things I find that we can ever witness, to strictly my opinion, is the restoration of old, outdated, falling apart houses, little shacks, houses that have been kept into renewed remodeled state-of-the-art dwelling places that when you take a look you go wow it's a double triple take of a place where you see they always show it at the end of the show it's really amazing they show the before and the after of the different rooms and i go wow this is so so nice you stay there stunned and amazed as you wonder how this was all done how was it all done how can we have so many skilled people to do these things, to repair the foundation, to move a wall here and to completely repair that part? It's a picture of hope where there seems to be no hope. You know, you've been living in that house or you've seen that house every day and you go, wow, what a, is that going to be abandoned one day or anybody still living there? And you see it and you may have even been inside and you go, whoa. This house is not very functional. I'm talking little houses that have little value on the market. And suddenly, someone's vision comes to light. And we see a brand new home. Hallelujah. The house that was previously hopelessly condemned is suddenly the most valuable home on the block. That's cool. I love that. But do you know where else you see these stories? Heaven. Heaven has untold stories of restoration and reconciliation of spiritual houses. You know, we're all a spiritual house, whether we host spiritual darkness or we host the spiritual light of heaven, but we are a spiritual house. We always need some kind of restoration or some kind of reconciliation inside, a spiritual reconciliation. And that's me. And that's you, and that's every believer whose Lord and Savior is Jesus. Jesus is here to change us, to remodel us into his image, to fix us up on the inside. Last year, the year before, I preached a series on building God's house. Uh, this is about, about a year ago, actually. How We looked at the foundation, and we looked at the electrical, the walls, the windows. We looked at the roof. We looked at all the different aspects. And that's kind of what this means here, to be reconciled unto Christ and to be changed into a whole new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And this is what I'm looking at. Hallelujah. And this is what reconciliation means. And this is the first part of a second of the two parts I want to finish off with. Verse 17 and 18 says this. And this is where we finished off last week. And he is before all things. That makes him preeminent. Verse 15 says, he is the image of the invisible God. Verse 17, and, this, and it says, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. All things are held together. All things basically exist because of him. Hallelujah. And verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So we looked last week at what made him preeminent. Hallelujah. And so today, we're starting at 19, going all the way to the end. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness 
shall dwell. Now let's take a look for a second at what Ephesians 1, 19 to 23 says. It says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Now, Paul wants us to know that in the book of Ephesians, that you may know all these things. To us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And that's just not, that's all kinds of power. That's all the definitions of power you can think about. His authority, his miracle working power, everything about him, who he is, his mighty power working through us. Verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now remember that word seated him. We're going to look at that word after, but remember that we got it from Ephesians 1.20. Then he goes on to say, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. He's talking about eternity here. Hallelujah. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus is all powerful, all knowing. Hallelujah. He is God. Praise his holy name. And in verse 20, it goes on to say, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now that's interesting. I like that. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. In other words, to bring it back to its original state. To bring it back to when we were in the garden. That's why he came. Mankind had been lost for, for 4,000 years. He flooded the earth. And that didn't help. Man came back. But because we were of a fallen nature. We were created in God's image and everything was going good till we go to Genesis chapter 3 and we find out what happened, which was an act of disobedience on one and then on the other. It's been like that ever since. Disobedience, rebellion. So he's here, Jesus is here to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth. See, the cross, and it's done through the piece of the cross here having made peace through the blood of his cross. See, he carried that cross. He carried that cross all the way through till the end. The cross is exceedingly, by far, the greatest turning point in the history of mankind. So things began to be undone from what they were done, meaning that whatever the enemy had done in our lives, we can undo that now okay so things began to be undone when a born again man gave his heart to jesus and we started doing the god things in other words like if you read luke chapter 4 verse 18 it says the spirit of god is upon me that's jesus talking he says he came over to heal deliver the people who were oppressed he healed the sick he raised the dead and those are all things now that we do so we're doing the god things now that's what he means. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Now we can do these things. We get to undo what the devil did, just like Jesus did back in the day. It's incredible. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful story of he himself coming down and destroying all the works of the devil, according to Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Hallelujah. There is no other event in history that can compare to the magnitude of the profoundness of the actions of one man, Jesus. To understand what happened when he came all of a sudden at the cross, when he died and rose again, there was that complete turnaround in history. Hallelujah. This part of history from the cross is a history of reconciliation now. Before it was condemnation, there was no way of us attaining heaven. But now we can through him. Hallelujah. The world has never been the same since. 
And one of the coolest things about all of this is that it was done in the spiritual realm and the physical realm simultaneously. He obeyed God. He obeyed the spiritual words of his father and he applied them in the natural realm and he healed people. He was obedient. We can see what happens when you're obedient in the spiritual of what happens in the natural. Hallelujah. And that is still alive and well today. Every physical action that Jesus did in the natural was a victory in the supernatural. Praise his name. His obedience to his own death opened the portal to the resurrection of all things. Everything now, in a sense of speaking, can be resurrected. Every person on this earth can be resurrected from death to life in Christ. Yes, we're still living in the same body. We can become born again, fill with his spirit, and do his work. That can happen to everybody. Hallelujah. See, the groundwork and foundation for a new world were now fully established for the next chapter in the history of mankind. That's why this book is so, so important to understand the ramifications and what happened um, with his coming to earth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Now, as we receive him, and as we give him permission to do what he needs to do in our lives, heaven is now free to roam on earth through the body, the church. Peace, the most desired commodity, would now be able to rule in the heart of man. Because see, he said that we have peace now through the blood of his cross. He establishes peace in our hearts. Glory to God. I love this word. Thank you, Lord. I encourage you to read this book of Colossians. I encourage you to, to read the whole Bible. It's an amazing book. Hallelujah. You get to find out that Christ is there from the very beginning to the end. Hallelujah. He is the center. Jesus Christ is the center of the Bible, the Word of God. Praise His name. So peace was made, so to speak, on that bloody cross. In the messy cruelty of a bloody cross, peace between God and man was forged. Hallelujah. And sealed forever. Praise His holy name. Now let's go to verse 21. And he goes on to say, And you who were once alienated or basically without peace and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. You had no peace. You were full of rebellion inside, even though you could have been a nice guy. Hey, but inside you were not born again. You were separated from God. But now he has reconciled you. Now he has put his peace in your heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, that we don't do wicked works no more by nature, but now we do good works by nature. Hallelujah. It's the same similarity in the scriptures as Ephesians 2, 2 to 3. It talks about that. We were once separated. It kind of says the same thing here. I'm loving this, man. This is way better than McDonald's. Hallelujah. And verse 22 says, in the body of his flesh. So let's go back here and read for a second here. And you were once alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works. How can we sin? We were by nature sinners, alienated and enemies of God. Yet now he has reconciled as we received him. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through his death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. See, Jesus is in the progress right now and working in us by his Holy Spirit in order to present his church to his Father. Hallelujah. Holy and blameless. You know what? We could be messed up still. But when we made a decision to follow him, it's not about being perfect. It's about, like I said, going on to perfection. It's about being transformed and renewed. That's not instantaneously that takes time hallelujah but we are on the road to perfection thank you lord jesus you see the blood of christ cleanses everything that has ever been and that will ever be wrong with you think about what i just said now okay everything that you hate about yourself in the past that you didn't like even now because you're still not fully transformed the blood takes care of all that stuff isn't that amazing? 
Thank you, Lord. And yet he presents to us before his father. Look at my son. Yeah, I know he messed up, but he's in my way. And give him time, Father. And he'll get over that part. And it will work on something else. That's the way the, the scriptures show it. That he wants to present us holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. When he says, look at Dennis. Look at Bob. Look at Syl. Look at Betty. These are my children. These are my followers. These are the ones that have been washed in the blood. My blood. Hallelujah. Everything that has ever been wrong with you, the blood has taken care of it. This is not earthly blood, by the way, folks. It is heavenly blood, sinless blood. It didn't come from his earthly father. His earthly father was Joseph, but he's not the one. Joseph was his stepfather, so to speak. But his heavenly father is the one that conceived Mary. Hallelujah. In the most holy way, praise his holy name. And so we are washed in that blood. Not just for the sins of the past, but for the sins of now that we foolishly commit at times and the future. That's why repentance on our part should never end. We should always be looking at repenting. Lord God, did I continue repeating that today? I need to stop doing this thing. There's either a jealousy in me or there's a little bit of a greed in me or there's a little bit of a lack of self-control in me. I need to stop what I'm doing and work on these things. And that's what repentance means, turning around, saying, I don't like that in my life. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to do the very best I can to not do that anymore. That's what repentance means, turning away from your sin. It continues on in verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith. So there's always an if there. There's always an if because we can't just say, Jesus, I accept you. I received you, my Lord and Savior. And never do anything good. You're not really in a good place. I'm not going to start saying, oh, he's saved or not saved. Or did he really mean it? You know what? We have to continue. If indeed you continue in the faith. Listen, don't ever give up. You ever see that old picture? Uh, it was a frog who held, the, I believe it was a crane. It had a long, long neck. It was a bird. The bird had swallowed. The frog partly swallowed. He was His legs were sticking out. But he was squeezing his throat. He says, you're not swallowing me. And it's such a cool picture. And never give up. You're going to go through some hard times in this world. And Jesus said it too. There's going to be troubles in this world. And the Bible talks about in Isaiah 60, there's going to be darkness and gross darkness. But we can live above that. Hallelujah. We can live in the midst of it and above it at the same time. So don't give up. Keep following Jesus. Keep praying. Keep reading his word. Ask him to come inside and just to refresh you inside. Hallelujah. To give you that new boost. And it goes on to say, I'll repeat it again. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast. Now those two words are very, very important. It gives a, a real picture. Now the word grounded in the Greek means to lay the foundation. The foundation of the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah of the prophets and the apostles, of all the letters, what we're reading here. And it also means to establish. And it comes from the Greek word familiu. It comes from the word theme. Is Jesus the theme of your life? The very, very theme, the foundation in him who is established. Is he established in your life? Is he the theme of your life? That's what grounded means. And he goes on to say, and steadfast. Well, that's the word settled so that means we're seated in a firm place it means firm it means immovable that means when you're steadfast that means when there's a hurricane wind so to speak you just stand there and everything around you is flying everything around you the trees are are being uprooted cars are flying but you are your hair is going too that's fine but you're standing there in that hurricane spiritual hurricane i'm talking about but it's funny to see some of these people that they'll hang on to a post well that's kind of who we are we're anchored in christ we're immovable because we've been grounded in his word and now we've become steadfast hallelujah god is so good verse 23 and they're not moved away from the hope of the gospel the hope of the gospel which you heard which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. 
Now we're talking meat and potatoes here about the gospel, about the word. of God. That's why I encourage everybody that's listening out there today, get into the word, study his word, read his word, get to know the Christ within you if you're saved. Get to know him better in a more deeper way, in a manner that's more personal. Don't just read superficially. Take time to find out what it means in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, in the Greek and New Testament, and find out. Find out. Dig. Study to show yourself approved. Hallelujah. And you're going to find your faith is going to grow because it grows through the Word of God. It grows from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Hallelujah. Never lose hope in Christ and what He has done for you. See, the gospel, the Word, is the hope of all nations. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know the Word. And you live life without any eternal hope. See, life for you is hopeless. But you don't even know that. Till all of a sudden you realize, man, oh man, if I get into a car accident, what's going to happen? Where am I going after? So you got all these questions and you're not saved. You're in a place of hopelessness until you come to Jesus. Now the second part is about living a sacrificial life for Christ. It's our sacrificial service for us to go through, actually, as we live our lives in Christ. As a believer, it's crucial to our growth and maturity. Do you know that you can't really grow unless you go through stuff? Every one of us is going to go through hard times. Some of us are going to go through really bad times. But it's par for the course. But guess what? He is there with you all the time. He says in his word, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will always be there. So it's our true consecration that stems from our acceptation of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. In other words, we can't just sit on the sidelines. We can't just say, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. Praise God. And avoid every hardship. You're going to be going through stuff a lot. And that's par for the course. You think Jesus didn't go through all that stuff? Man, he was persecuted throughout his whole ministry. Even the non-religious people persecuted him and says, oh, he's just a son of Joseph and Mary. And then you get the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and all these teachers. And they all came against him all the way through. So from the time he became a preacher from the age of 30, when he got baptized and filled the Holy Spirit, it started, he went into the desert. He went through stuff. He fasted. He was tempted for 40 days. He went through stuff. We're going to go through stuff. He says that we are not greater than our master. So you got to wonder something. Don't go looking for it. It'll come to you. Don't worry about it. It'll come. Just keep serving the Lord Jesus. Keep speaking the truth. Keep doing what you're supposed to do according to his word. And you'll find yourself in a place where, whoa, okay. But you keep moving on. Because why? Because you're grounded and you're steadfast in his word. Hallelujah. Let the winds blow. Let the waves come. Harness those winds and harness those waves. That's the theme for my wife this, this year that she had. So praise his holy name. Hallelujah. And he goes, And I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Because Paul suffered to get the word out. He suffered. He went through a lot of stuff, Paul. And he says here, I now rejoice my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. In other words, he wants to go through stuff because that stuff, all the negative things, all the trials and temptations of life refine you. You come out after as pure silver and pure gold. Thank you, Lord. For the sake of his body, which is the church. So we do that not for ourselves, but for the others. Hallelujah. There's people coming after you that are going to be able to see you as an example. Man, that guy went through a lot of stuff. Look at the stuff he went through, but look at how he came out of that. And look at who he is now because of that. We must go through stuff in our life with Christ. In our modern era, with all our human rights laws, it would seem that we don't get to go through stuff like the persecution of the early church. There wasn't laws that protected you. We have that today. So it would kind of seem like we're not doing as much. But let me tell you, if we get into the word, and if we are not afraid to preach the gospel, and stand on that, and not let ourselves be pushed back, and I'm not talking about being 
forward and assaulting and all that. No, 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 no. I'm talking about being loving, being caring, and, and preaching Jesus. You're going to get persecuted. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah because it's glory to God. I speak like that a lot because everything about the word is hallelujah, whether good or bad. Because there's always something that comes out of the bad that's going to be good. Thank you, Lord. The moment, like I said, you seriously step out in faith and the boldness in Christ, the devil awaits you with all that he has. But that should never bring any sort of fear upon the church, upon yourself. We were called for this, whether 2,000 years ago or now. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says this, If we desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, guess what? we will suffer persecution. Par for the course, folks. Par for the course. We're going to lose family, loved ones. I know when he first got saved, man, oh man, I got mocked and ridiculed. But I was so filled full of joy knowing that I was going to heaven. Nothing was going to knock me off. But I mean, I lost a whole bunch of friends. I remember I used to hang out with a bunch of people at the mines where I used to be before. And we used to swear and smoke and drink and talk dirty and talk all these things that a normal unsaved guy would do to be part of a group then all of a sudden slowly but surely i started weaning myself away because somebody was talking to me about jesus and then i got saved the lord was doing something in my heart but then when the moment i got saved man when i came into that lunchroom i i didn't beeline for my guys for my old guys i beeline for the believers and then all of a sudden, the guys turned around. Some of them were saying, hey, what are you doing sitting over there now? And mocking me. Oh, you're one of those light brights now and reborns and all those things. We've had our share of persecution. But praise God, we were strong enough with friends and the church and just to keep going. The choice we make will decide the persecution we experience. If you read the Josiah Manifesto, a book by Jonathan Kahn, it just tells you how we are to live in these last days and according to the word of God. And it's just mind-blowing, but yet it's very, very sobering. For some of us, sometimes we tend to slack off and we tend to just kind of like find a nice soft cushion to sit on, spiritually speaking. This is an awakener. I advise you guys, read that book, talking about King Josiah. And it's by Jonathan Kahn. So, and then he continues on, of which I became a minister. He's talking about the gospel here. To one degree or another, listen, folks, we're all ministers. To one degree or another. Don't use that word minister and say, oh, minister preacher. Oh, he's a minister of this church. He's the head honcho. Don't look at it that way. We're all ministers. We minister the gospel. If you talk to somebody on a street corner or on a bus, in a mall, in a grocery store, wherever you are, if you start speaking to him about Jesus... If you open up that door, if that door becomes open, then you just enter in and you speak. You're a minister. You're ministering the gospel. Hallelujah. And it says here, continues on, according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you. So Paul's talking about himself here. But it's for all of us to fulfill the word of God. And so we are all in the plan of God. Every single believer is in the plan of God. Every person, God has a plan for them. Hallelujah. So don't ever feel that, oh, I don't know what God has planned for me. Get into the word. Get into understanding what the general will of God is. And God will show you what his will is for you. His plan. Hallelujah. Verse 26 goes, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Oh, I love mystery movies, folks. I love anything that's a mystery because I want to know how it ends or I want to find out that revelation. And the word of God is the book of mysteries of mysteries of all the books ever written. The Bible is filled with mysteries, but mysteries that can be explained and revealed to us, which is so cool. In other words, God's not hiding anything anymore through Jesus Christ, his son, when we receive him. We can learn so much, and there's so much to learn that we will never learn it. The best of us, the best and the greatest of the scholars that understand the deep mysteries of God are just basically tapping into the whole thing. We're going to know him more and more and more. 
But what he's saying here is that the mystery of what has been hidden for ages is now revealed to his saints. Wow. Through Christ, everything is open for revelation. Jesus' death and resurrection flung the, the gates wide open in the understanding of mysteries. If you want to understand the mysteries of God, he will reveal them to you. But he won't just reveal them to you if you don't do anything. He reveals to you as you read his word. You have to work in conjunction with his spirit and his word in order to be able to understand him. Nothing is hidden anymore because of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. Right on. This is good stuff. This is really good stuff. Not because I'm saying it, but because of the word. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. He gives me great joy right now. It is my great joy right now to delve into his word like this. Because I know what it can do for me and I know what it can do for you. Hallelujah. It's an awesome word. Let's continue. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Imagine, imagine now with me for a second. God. God, the creator of heaven and earth, dwelling in you now. You know what's happening right now to me? Overload, overload. That is just too much for me to contain and understand. The greatest mystery, even amongst the Gentiles, he's talking to about us now. That God would live and dwell inside of me by his spirit is mind-blowing. Hallelujah. To say the very, very least... Imagine the greatest revelation of all eternity is Christ coming into man by his spirit and indwelling in us. The blessings are inexplicable and unexplainable. Speechless. Christ in us, the hope of glory. He is your hope for eternity. Him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. And if you want wisdom, you'll get it from God. You're going to come up with stuff and go, that is super cool. But that's the wisdom of God. I never thought that. That came into my spirit right now. And I just realized that, wow, that was wisdom from God. So he says, teaching every man in all wisdom. You can get wisdom just like that by James talks about if we want wisdom, get into the word. Hallelujah. Ask, but don't ask with a double mind. Ask with a focus. God, I need your wisdom, Lord. I need your wisdom. Not I need your wisdom, God. And oh man, I can't wait to the hockey game tonight. Lord, I need your wisdom. Man, that car, that new car I was just looking at. Not like that, man. You got to be focused. Don't be double minded. Don't have a thought here and a thought there and a thought here and a thought there and ask for wisdom. No, be focused in him. Hallelujah. James chapter 1 talks about that. And he wants to give it to you. He desires to give you wisdom so that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We're perfected with his wisdom. Thank you, Lord. That's why it's so important to preach the word to others. Of all the things people share with one another in this world, Christ in us is the most important do you know Jesus? Talking about who Jesus is. The preeminent one. The one who created all things. Without him, nothing would hold together in this world. Imagine if he said to this mountain, I'm going to take everything of who I am. I'm going to stop holding this mountain together with my power. That mountain would just go right down to dust, to nothing. That's who he is. In him, all things consist. To believe in him as the Son of God, and to receive what He has done for you and for me. Well, what has He done? He gave His life, first of all. So you know what you need to do? You need to receive His life. And He forgave you of all your sins when He was on that cross. Father, forgive them for they know what not what they do. So receive that forgiveness and stop living in condemnation the forgiveness that you receive from him understand that you're forgiven you can't go back in the past as well i'm i did this oh i remember last year did that 
No, I'm just reaping all this. No, that's all forgiven. It's all forgiven. Understand that he also gave you true life. He gave his life so that he can give you true life. No Jesus, nada. No Jesus, no life. When you get to know Jesus, you'll get to know what true life is. So no Jesus, no life. You know Jesus, you know him in his word, you've accepted him, now you're going to get to know life and understand life in him. Hallelujah. See, you have the truth about everything inside of you. Explore all of his truths. Praise his holy name. Because there's so much going on out there. We need to kind of just bring all our focus into his word, into who he is, and praise him. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise for all the things he's done, for all the things you're going through. Whether you're going through a hardship, give him praise. And the last verse of the chapter here, and I'm done, it says, To this end I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. In other words, the Spirit of God, as we work for Him, the works that He has for us works mightily. Let me repeat that verse again. To this end, I also labor, or I work on His behalf. I do the work according to the gospel, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. In other words, striving with, with the help of the Holy Ghost that is in me, that works mightily. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, that we're not just working on our be we're not just working on our behalf or in our own strength. We have the strength of the Holy Spirit. See, we cannot take this lightly and sit on the sidelines. Eternity is at stake. And so we must work by his spirit and occupy by his spirit. Occupy till he comes, the Bible says. So when we take land, we occupy that land. We keep working. We keep ourselves occupied by occupying. Hallelujah. Well, listen, folks, that's the end of the chapter. I hope you've enjoyed it. But I want to ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? If you don't know Jesus today, I encourage you. You can accept him right now. If this message you've listened to has touched you in a way, all you have to say is, Jesus, just say the simple prayer. Jesus, come into my life. I know that you are the Son of God now. I, I've, I was told your word according to uh, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And I understand that you are the Son of God. And that if I confess you as my Lord and Savior, that I'm going to be a new man, a new creature. Hallelujah. So that's all you need to do is turn away from the lifestyle you've been living and follow Jesus. It's as simple as it gets. Jesus says, come follow me. And I will make you fishes of men. So come today and follow Jesus. Turn away from the old ways. And he will restore you. He will fix you up. Don't worry about come the way you are. It's like a mechanic that's all got dirty hands and his coveralls. And someone invites him over across the street and says, come here. But I'm just, look at this gala here that's happening here. But look at, I'm not dressed. Oh, it doesn't matter. Come the way you are. Come the way you are to him. Turn your heart toward him. He'll come into your life and change you. Hallelujah. So, Father, thank you, Lord God, for your word. And I just pray, oh God, that it would penetrate deep into our hearts. And, Lord, I just want to thank you for your Holy Spirit that works in us, Lord God, that indwells in us. And I pray, oh God, that you would strengthen all of us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Well, I hope you were enriched in his word today. And I hope to see you again as we look at chapter 2 next week. Or parts of. We'll see. Hallelujah. Have a great week in Jesus.